Tonight, on the anniversary of his death, we bring together a group of stellar magicians who come here to pay tribute to the unique, magical talent of the man. And later on tonight, for the first time on live television, we will conduct a seance to reach the spirit of the great Houdini, the gap. Houdini said he would try to bridge. So, in keeping with the spirit of the evening, let me start out with a trick of my own. If you will watch very carefully as I clap my hands together three times, one, two, three. Hey everyone ever, and welcome to 20th Century Pop, the show where we try to understand the present while living in the past. My name is Tim Blevins. And I am Bob Canning. Tim, uh, are you are you going trick or treating this year? I should have said something, right? I should have done a spooky start because you had to reach for that because you know the answer, obviously. No, I don't. I don't want to have to introduce myself to the neighborhood the day after Halloween. No, I'm not going to go trick or treating. But it is our Halloween based episode. I should have done. I did, the ending was so upbeat. The ending, the opening was so. Um, it was the ending because of death, Ooh, but opening. Right. That was an upbeat intro. And I, I, I what didn't have Halloween on the mind. No. Uh, well, you know, perhaps what you'll do is you'll add that spooky music underneath and and the vibe will be there. Oh, maybe. Which will uh, make this conversation more pertinent and relevant. Could could be. Could be. Are, uh, but yeah, happy Halloween, Bob. That's happy I can Halloween, say that to you. Yeah. I think this is actually airing on or streaming on or maybe not on Halloween. <laughs> right. Are you are you is trick or treating something you'll be doing with with uh with your kids? With the ladies, yeah. The the girls um have already got is that the what you're calling them out? You call them the ladies? I do, I call them the you ladies. Do? Okay. I'm gonna call them your kids. You can call them my kids, I call them my girls, I call them the ladies. I have I live with three women and so they, they get called the ladies quite often. Are they little women? Uh two of them are. Actually, all three of them are quite small. That's weird. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, one of them you're married to. Right. Of your three daughters, you married one. <laughs> Not so quite. That's, okay. Not quite. I got gotcha. you. But are you, um, yes, are you, <laughs> to replicate the conversation we had on a previous Halloween episode <laughs> last year, are you going trick-or-treating with the girls? I will be. I will be trailing them as they go door to door. Sounds like a lot of work. I don't think I could do it. Uh, it's okay, you know. Uh, and I, we might have, if if this is a replication of a previous conversation, I probably previously told you that we usually get other families that come to our neighborhood, and we all trick or treat together. That's what sounds like a lot of work. Being yeah, socializing with the other families. Uh, yeah, the, these are some of the few people I enjoy spending time with and feel comfortable with. They come over. We order pizza. Um, the the kids play around a little bit. They get a little hyper. We get bored and decide to go trick or treating a little earlier than we probably should. Spare no details, by the way. In I the description shall of not. Halloween. Thank and you. And at the first house, no. Um, but yeah, no. It's it's uh, it's been a pretty fun tradition. Halloween for me was really not about the, the the candy hunting and all of that. It wasn't about the going door to door, even though I did that for about ten years of my life or whatever. But Halloween to me was always about TV, as I guess a lot of things were. And it's about specials. There are always some good specials on throughout the month of October. We've talked about some of those in the past, the Charlie Brown special. Uh, we've done movies like Monster Squad, Teen Witch. But something that I vividly remember, and it's, it's we're going to talk about tonight, is I, I remember the, the, the TV specials tailored to Halloween that would air, um, hosted by, we'll call them a celebrity, but you might call them Alan Thicke or something like that, but a special that would air that um, would tap into something kind of spooky or something, maybe a little dark or little something Hollywood-based, mysterious. Yeah. And it would just, you know, it would just be something that would be airing at night. It would be a nice little special because it, it, it would remind me of ghosts or remind me of, you know, the... You know the, the the horror aspects of the of, of the holiday, and because it was being presented by someone in, in in the circles of TV or film, and because it was talking about events and people that really happened, it was one of those things where I got to kind of experience the paranormal through a special on TV during this month, which is already kind of creepy. And and you know because it was a live action news, I thought, well, this is factual, and I'm learning about UFOs or ghosts or 
in reference to tonight's topic, what what what, what are we going to talk about, or at least what's our jumping off point tonight to talk about? Because you also, I was happy to hear that you saw this special that we're going to talk about when it aired as well. Oh, I was I was thrilled to see this special. It it was so fascinating to know it was it was even something that existed. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, the 1987 live special, The Search for Houdini. Right? Which, the Harry Houdini. Yeah, yeah, which for anyone that, that doesn't know what that is, um, and I don't know what network put this on, I'm going to guess CBS. I'm thinking it might have been syndicated. Okay, um, that's There true. were a few clips online, and, and from the little intro and outros, it sounded like it might have been a syndicated okay. special. Yeah, I'm not sure. It was, But it was a live broadcast, The Search for Houdini, essentially... Um, it was a bunch of magicians and, and illusionists um, paying homage to Houdini. Um, but also, there was going to be a live seance to try and connect with the spirit of Houdini in the afterlife. Now, do you, did you know Houdini? Did you know about like, I have the backstory to know why that's relevant as a kid or even I, now? I learned about it. In that episode, I knew Houdini as the escape artist, magician, illusionist, what, um, that that character, that persona. I knew Houdini. Uh, I knew he died um, from a punch to the gut that caused his appendix to burst or something like that. Uh, but I didn't know he died on Halloween night. Yeah. So that gives it a little already a little bent of, of, of eeriness. Yes. That's and an eerie I didn't night to go. know until this special aired. That he had um, basically committed to reaching out from the afterlife to prove that that was possible. This idea of a live special probing into something, this idea that it was happening as I was watching it and anything could go wrong, even though it was still theatrics, even though it was still sort of set up for the camera. These specials are always kind of, you know, they would be a night event that go an hour or two hours. And they were usually built up of little, you know, obviously little segments for a bigger segment. So in the case of a magic act, you're seeing little tricks in different parts of the country before the big trick is staged. And this particular special hosted, by the way, did we mention who hosted the special? We did not mention the host, the the great and and, and, uh, lovely William Shatner is the host um this would have been coming the year after star trek 4 so i knew who he was clearly i knew him from star trek 4 i knew him from star trek yeah my memory of the special of when the special aired because i taped it i remember videotaping this when it when it it aired that halloween night my memory was thinking okay william shatner's hilarious My memory of this was he's just improvising, he's making jokes, he's he's a Starfleet captain, and here he is just cutting up. He's hilarious. This was like the first time I saw the fun William Shatner persona, and I we were able to find it. This is a hard. We're going to get into why this is eerie to me. This is a hard special to to, to track down information about. There are some clips online, and there are clips of him. And did you remember him as the host? Did you remember I, that he was the? Did not, this? No, I did not until we decided that we were going to do this. Um, I, I remembered the special. Um, would you have known who William Shatner was I at probably that time? would have. Yeah, I think I would have known who William Shatner was. But I did not recall that he was the host. He was not the draw for me. Um, Nor should he have been based <laughs> on the clips we saw. He's horrible in this. Uh, yeah. Um, he doesn't seem to really take the whole thing seriously. Um, and, uh, yeah, he's, he's his usual kind of over the top self in, in some of the segments that we saw. I feel um, like this might've been the introduction to that self. Like this was, oh, again, okay. this was him being jokey and I just, yeah. I liked it at the time, but watching it, it was very painful. It was interesting because everything's a single shot in this. Like it's always one long lingering shot on William Shatner, or as we're going to talk about in a minute, the illusionists who are performing. So yeah, it's, he's not good. <laughs> No, I think he he yeah, he he's uh not committed to the conceit of what the special was about. And not, he would have been part of the draw for why I yeah. watched it. He would have been the other part. Leonard Nimoy would have been the better host. I think Leonard Nimoy has hosted something probably there's there's an in search of episode about yeah. Houdini. But um so you were drawn to this you 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 want to see it. now what what's your memory of this special cuz again we 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 both I think found some clips online we did a little research to to, to talk about it. So and my memory talk- of it before we found these clips my memory of it was 
uh, the special about Houdini. So we got to learn a little bit about Houdini. Um, we got to see some of his famous tricks uh, and, and escapes uh, reenacted um, or, or redone or reimagined. And uh, and then we got to watch the seance of, of people um, that either were related to him or friends of his uh, try and draw him uh, out of the spirit world and into the, the, this theater where they were putting on this, this show. Um, and I just remembered my memory of it. And unfortunately I couldn't find a clip of the seance. Really. We have a, like a really short one, um, but there's really nothing about the clip and we don't see how the seance ends in the clips that we were able to find. Um, but my memory of it was, is that sort of like the Geraldo special, they had to say good night, but we'll continue to, to, the seance into the into the evening or whatever um I'm not, i don't know that that's actually how it ended but that's sort of the memory i had so spoiler alert they um to how it aired at least uh they didn't contact correct me. i was i had that disappointment but going into it did you think there was a chance that could happen did you think you might see I some sort of contact there, on the I air i thought there could be a chance i i knew enough about houdini to know that he was a spooky kind of character had some mystery around him um, I, I, I understood seances. I think it's Slender Man is what you're thinking. <laughs> Slender Man is probably the one. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know that I had no opinion of whether seances were real or fake. Um, and I probably at that time, I believed that that sort of thing was possible. Um, and I might still. Is the concept of a seance something that you would find eerie now? Yes, I would find it eerie now. Uh, especially in the right setting with the right people. You know, if if William Shatner were there, maybe not so eerie. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I would find it eerie now. I was thrilled for that part of the special. I couldn't yeah. wait for the seance to the point that I think even when I was watching it, I think I remember think I, my feeling was, oh, thank God William Shatner's here to liven this up. Because, <laughs> th- you know, this was an intricate special in that they're bringing a lot of different escape artists and performers together. Yeah. And that was that is was exciting. I don't know if something like this would be exciting for me now. I don't know that that there is even enough magicians that anyone would care about now. Well, I mean, do you think people knew who all these? That's the thing. Like this special well, introduces a, a couple of the other escape artists. The one uh, the, specifically, a, a gentleman named um, is it Dean Gunnerson? Gunnerson. I was looking up. He would have been maybe twenty three at the time. He's. He's a world-renowned and maybe one of the most famous escape artists. He has a lot of records in the record books. Like he's done a lot of like escaping from a, a barrel and suspension over uh, Niagara Falls. He was buried in concrete and got out. He he kind of re- his one of his rising the fame moments was he he nearly died in 1983 in this trick where he was put in a coffin that was thrown into water and as part of the escape mechanism failed and he was nearly drowned. And I guess he's still performing to this day, but he takes up a lot of the special. He does. <laughs> he's very proud to well, be on Well, based on the, the clips special. that we were able to find. That's true. And that's, well, let's talk about that then. All right. In an era where everything's on YouTube, mm. <laughs> like you can type in and find clips, you can find text. I remember this special. I've always remembered this special growing up. And a couple years ago, actually, and I'll link to this in the show notes, I wrote a very brief little piece for this for the website of this very show, when it was 20podcast.com. I wrote a, a little piece about this special, kind of about my memories of it and what happened. And it was very short, but I knew I had to do a little research. And there's very little about this special online. There's a few YouTube clips um, there's a blog post from from a Houdini website, which I'll be quoting from probably later on. But the, the, there's not a lot. You're right. There's not a lot out there. We, I was able to find maybe three clips from the special, I think. Yeah, three or four. So so it's sparse to find. But from what I saw, it looked like this particular escape artist, Dean Gunnerson, uh, did probably three different performances through the course of the night. Yeah. He did a, a pre-taped one where he was suspended uh, and escaped the straitjacket. Um, and then he came live on stage. So they did the pre-tape and then they welcomed him to the stage. And uh, uh, a curator of the Houdini Museum brought uh, actual handcuffs that Houdini had escaped from. And uh, kind of, s- we're told, surprised him with uh, challenging him to escape out of, out of those handcuffs. So he did that live on stage. And then... 
There was another magician. I believe it was the great Randy. The amazing the Randy. The amazing well, not that Randy. Per- he was the invalid Randy the that invalid. particular evening. He is. Uh, he was an older gentleman, um, famous for uh, doing escapes. And he, earlier in the day during rehearsal, hurt himself, broke some vertebrae. Allegedly. Allegedly broke his vertebrae doing the milk barrel or, uh, or milk can uh, escape. Uh, where you go into a milk can filled with water or milk, uh, in this case water, and he hurt himself. So they asked uh, Mr. Gunderson to take his place, and he performed that trick as well. So It's staged as if they're asking him as they bring him out. <laughs> it's staged as if he was, for some reason, because the, the amazing Randy, I don't know if you described this, he's in a, he's in a hospital bed. Yes, They a wheel it on stage, a gurney, thank you. He's in immense pain. He wanted to be there, but he couldn't perform the stunt. But he asked if maybe Dean could do it. And Dean runs out, not fully dressed. He's got pants on and a leather vest, but he forgot to put a shirt on. <laughs> and he's he's not very he's not a good speaker in this special. I yeah, think well, he's grumpy. Like he, I think he's from like what? What did you say? Romanian. He's Canadian. Can, oh, he's so Canadian. Most of their words are also the uh, words we would use. I can see how he could but, really um, perform. But they bring him out and he, to do the trick. But it's just, I mean, that watching that now, I think I was bored by him then as a kid. I don't think I was a fan of it. Watching it now just seems staged. It's like, oh, I guess I can do this trick. I'll try. It's like, I don't think the insurance of the show would have allowed any random person to hop in a milk jug and nearly drown for the bit. Yeah, and the thing about escapes is they're just not very engaging to watch. Like the one where he escapes from Houdini's handcuffs, he's doing this basically inside a large knapsack that is interminable. And he's sketch. rolling around for like eight minutes. <laughs> yeah. And no time limit was ever set. He could have been doing that for another 15 minutes. That's it, one of the segments I remember because that's as a child where I thought, William Shatner is hilarious. He's just ad-libbing he through all to, of this. He had to because nothing else was happening. <laughs> well, the bag was rolling the around. The bag was rolling around. On stage. And uh, I thought the uh, – the because they, they also brought the police chief from South Pasadena in – to uh, to check the handcuffs and everything, he was also pretty funny in this uh, uh, ongoing bag writhing moment. Uh, so yeah, it it was you know a lot of filler, it seems to get to the a lot of to the filler seance. and a lot just filmed as a single shot. Yeah, like that's what really I know it's just a few clips, but it really struck me. And I guess honestly, that's what you want in magic. You want to be able to see the whole trick. But... Exactly, and William Shatner made it clear that there will be no camera tricks. During tonight's uh, uh, presentation. He did. He made that interminably clear. It's yeah. an interminable special, people. I'm going to reuse that <laughs> word tonight. But um, no, I just... You would be the, remiss not to, Tim. Ah, oh, another word I can't stand. <laughs> um, that's, by the way, a callback to something no one else heard because it's not part of the episode. That's my favorite thing that we do on this show is, is make callbacks to things no one else will get. Well, maybe if we're the only listeners, the audience does get it. <laughs> but I just, I it was the show is oddly paced. The, not, I mean, our show too, but the, the William Shatner <laughs> Houdini special. Because again, it's I, watching these clips, and we'll link to them in the show notes. They are just stationary, cheap-looking on videotape shots. There's not the spectacle of a lot of quick cutaways or text being written on the screen. Like even when they're talking about Houdini, because one of the clips they talk a little bit about his past. There's a few black and white photos and shots, but it's mostly just people talking to the camera. And it's, I'm curious to what I, th- I don't know what I thought of it back then, because it, there, it's not, this part of it isn't very Halloween-esque. Right. It's magic, and that's fun. And I think if you're a houdini file, which is not what they're called, it's probably very exciting. But I don't know, like the clips you were watching, was there any bit of a, of, a, of, a, of like a little nudge of like, hey, it's Halloween, this is great. This is when you no. would watch it, like, yeah, it didn't have a, a Halloween vibe. These it just looked like a magic special, which there were plenty of uh, during my youth. I remember Copperfield and Henning all over the place as a kid. And a last name basis with these two. Yes. But so why does it stick in your mind? Why do you remember because this? Because they were going to speak to the dead spirit of Harry Houdini. That's why it sticks in my mind. That's why I watched it, uh, and that's why I'll never forget it. Um, but there are no good clips of the seance online. There's no good clips, and it'd be easy to kind 
kind of forget. Again, it makes sense that there's no good clips. It wasn't a good special. Right. I'm sure people have. I mean, I taped it. I remember taping it on VHS. I don't know if I still have that tape. I would have gone back to it. Um, so I guess that's why it's not up on YouTube. But still, you know, if you Google search it, it brings a couple, you know, it brings up an IMDb page. Um, one thing that it does bring up, and this maybe we can segue into this for a minute. That it, it, I was in, when I first was looking into this special a couple of years ago again. Um, you know, curious about the seance part because I didn't remember much of it. Uh, typing it in, I came across a, a blog called Wild About Harry. Um, it's located at wildabouthoudini.com. Apparently, Harry's Razors already has the website or something. But there's an article from 2012 on that that I found when I was researching this as a topic that makes is why I return to this special now. There's an interesting story about this special, an urban legend about this special that I didn't know when I saw it. I wasn't aware of it until a few years ago, but it's rather creepy about this Houdini special. Did you know? Did you? I uh, know you, you introduced up? me to this. I did not. I, know I did. Okay. Yeah. So, so again, the the centerpiece is this seance that they did where they try to contact Houdini. It's it's a yearly thing. Up until 2011, they did it every year. There's a Houdini Society. There's um, one of the foremost, I guess, world's foremost Houdini aficionados, Sidney Radner, who passed away a few years ago, was kind of the organizer of it. Um, and every year on October 31st, the day Houdini died, they would try to contact him. So that that was the, the gimmick of the special. And my guess would be it's it's more theatrics. I don't know if everyone involved is really thinking they're going to contact him. You know, I think people just like to wear the costumes. They like to respect the memory of Houdini. And again, it's it's Halloween. You want to do something spooky. You want a spooky story. But here's the thing, too. Uh, from what I read about that is that it was a private ceremony most of the time. They would make it public now and again. And they were doing oh, it. Oh, the seance. The, the, yeah. They, yes, the seance. And they were doing. Oh, sorry about that. That was a, a door slam. How did that happen? And a moan. I'm, and a rattle of chains. I'm just kidding. That was my daughter wishing me good night. Sorry about oh, the interruption. That's sweet. But the, the seance that this group would do, they were doing for years before this live special. So what do you think the point of that was? Well, the point of that was that these were people that really wanted to connect with the, the spirit of Harry Houdini. These were family and friends, and they really wanted to do it. Um, and then... They, I, I don't know, some producer got wind of it and decided to make a special out of it. And so um, they did that this particular year, and then they've been doing it since. And like you said, up until 2011, um, there were times that it, that they would make it public, but then there were times it was just private. So this wasn't just a spectacle. They really were doing this. There was a group of people that, that did this. All right. So I didn't know. I, I guess that changes my opinion a little bit. So they are trying to contact Houdini. They do, they do hope it's successful. Yeah. As a centerpiece of a live show as a child, I guess my thought would be like, hey, maybe I'll see it. You know, like nowadays, I don't think I would expect to necessarily see it on live TV. But as a child, I guess it would have been like, oh, this could be cool. So obviously, it's disappointing because the way the special ends to ruin it is they, they what we see on the screen, they don't contact them. William Shatner even comes out. I don't know if you saw this bit and gives a little little monologue about how sometimes things don't happen. So for a live show, you at least don't that's get how I remember ghost. it. I don't I don't believe there's a clip of the ending available i didn't see a recent clip that's how uh, I, there is i saw I, oh, okay. I watched the end of it i saw the end of it and but to 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 coincide with that i read a piece i found a piece a little blog entry online um about the show that i don't know when this the story that i'm about to tell this little memory of it i don't know when it first surfaced because it's not part of the show it's not you don't see this happen on the show i was not aware of it till a few years ago but as a child, if I knew this particular story was part of this special that I had actually actively watched live, I would be horrified. I'd be terrified. It would have spooked the shit out of me. And I would have poured over this VHS tape. I probably would still have this VHS right. tape if I had known of this particular. You would have, you would have, it would have been the first thing you showed me Halloween night or uh, freshman year in college. Right, because if I had this backstory, let me get into the backstory so people know what I'm talking about. I, I, I again, I, I discovered this a couple years ago on a, on a website called WildAboutHoudini.com. Um, we'll link the article in the show notes along with the author's name. I appreciate that they wrote this because it brought so there, he has a couple articles on the website about this particular special. But one of them is a little article where he's talking about. Um, 
there was a special effects technician on this actual program on the search for Houdini. Um, special effects meaning working on like how uh, maybe lighting effects, an effect technician for like how the lights and stuff worked. Um, and, and so this little article, this little blog post recounts that he was talking about how the seance part of the show at the end of the show, um, and you can see it's on a giant sound stage. It was staged around a large table and, um, you know, they were all sitting around the table as you, as you do in a seance. And, and they were asked, this technician was asked to help install a plexiglass top, a clear plexiglass top of the table so that they could set lights beneath the table that would kind of produce um, an eerie glow across the face of the participants. Um, I don't know if it's a camera trick, but it was just like ambiance, make it a little more spooky, a little more Halloween. Like, because, you know, the spe special was performed live. The seance, I guess, was unscripted or it was a live seance. It wasn't like written to be entertainment. But um, so according to this effect technician who was on, you know, he would have been uh, working right off stage, working the lights or something at that time. Um, as the seance uh, got underway, um, as it was being filmed live and as they film it, they, the camera does do a little bit of movement, cutting back to different people because someone's narrating it. This this technician claims that as they were filming one end of this plexiglass top um, of the table started to warp, started to slightly bend, to, to, to bend upwards about six inches from what this technician said. So there's people sitting around it, people with their hands on it, and the, and the tables, the glass of it bends or curves a little bit yeah. while it's being broadcast live, but more so in an unplanned fashion. Um, not something that they wanted to happen, just something that was slowly starting to happen. And, and meaning that the, the person filming probably wasn't even aware of it, but apparently one of the producers saw it. One of the offstage producers noticed it, saw it, and screamed, go to commercial! Wanted to get out of that because something was happening that this producer didn't think would happen. And the special cuts. They, they cut to William Shatner standing at a different part of the stage, quickly saying, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be right back, and they, they cut away. And there's a commercial. And when they return, and I, I vaguely remember this from the special when I saw the clip. It didn't strike me as odd then. But when they return, William Shatner and, 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 the, and the people at the table are still seated at the table. They're assembled on stage. And they seem a little shaken. You can see it a little bit. They, 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 they seem a little off script or something, like they're stumbling to read the teleprompter. Um, William Shatner is, is talking to the camera. And you know, he's saying nothing was achieved. You know, it's live TV. Nothing was achieved, but they're going to keep trying. He kind of says good night, you know, farewell and good night. And then, you know, they cut to the credits. And it's, you know, it's an awkward, yeah. somewhat Geraldo Rivera-like <clears throat> finale. Um, yeah, I, the, I wish we had the whole special so we could get the cadence of those commercial breaks to see how unexpected and out of the ordinary this particular commercial break would have well, been again the clip is there and you don't see it you don't see the, uh, the the article says you can see one of the people at the table look at the glasses it starts yeah to bend, but that's you the don't one see thing it. that i do see in the clip and and i'm sure you'll link to it um and but you do see that you, you don't see that i don't i don't see the plexiglass but i you do see the person looking i do at see it? the person looking repeatedly off to his left He's the guy center. <clears throat> He's the one do doing the actual speaking. Um, and he keeps looking over to his left as he's he's saying, you know, oh, Harry, um, you know, come speak to us, whatever he's saying. Um, so he keeps looking over to his left. And and before I, re I, I watched the clip before I read the article explaining what happened. OK. So as he kept looking to his left, I found that to be very odd. Oh, before reading the article about what was happening. Exactly. I was like, why is this guy like looking to his left? What I keep looking to see if something was happening. Was something about to happen? Was somebody coming on stage? Was he reading cue cards? I just couldn't figure out why he kept doing it. It was out of the ordinary. Then I read the article, the, uh, the blog post that you, you linked me to. Um, and then I was like, oh, so then I go back and I keep my eye on the plexiglass. I don't see it moving. We don't always get a full shot, but there's enough that you would think you'd see it if, if it were really happening. Mm -hmm. But still him looking off to the left is kind of a weird, crazy thing. And, and what, what you have left out, maybe you were going to get to it. So I'm sorry if I cut you off, but, 
uh, what that gentleman, the lighting technician, also said in this post was that at, during that commercial break, he described it as chaos, as everyone was was panicking and trying to figure out what happened, and and the heat of the light could not possibly have done it. The lights weren't hot at all. The plexiglass was too thick to even be affected by the temperature, and so it was like chaos, is how he described the 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 break. So that's an awesome fucking story. It yeah. gives me chills thinking right? about that. Um, I didn't know it at the time. It's years later that we hear the story. And unfortunately, it's a story for something that, again, barely exists now. On, it's odd when there's not purpose, a lot. Of, perhaps. What was that? Perhaps it's not a, available on purpose. Well, there's a lot of footage of supposed ghosts online. <laughs> Here, I, I just... And here's one thing I'll, I'll ask, and then I'll, I'll get back on that track. The part of the story that's equal parts scary and doesn't add up is the part where you start thinking about the producer shouting, cut to commercial or go to commercial. That's terrifying. Like they're seeing something and they're like, we have to get out of this somehow. This is an audience full of people and something's about to happen. We can't broadcast this. That's creepy, right? It is if it's related to uh, uh, some sort of spectral um, interference, sure. Well, which is what this story is telling. Right, but what the story could understand. also be saying uh, a prop is malfunctioning and somebody might get hurt. We got to cut to commercial so we can check this out. Oh, okay. Because I was going is that what you think there is mean, happening? These are the more normal, commonplace things that likely were happening. And and the way you described, uh, I do want to clarify this. The way you described William Shatner is saying, uh, uh, "We'll be right back." It wasn't like that. He did have like a, a 20 second uh, little segue from the seance to the to the commercial. So there's not oh, any sort of panic yeah. in William Shatner as he's mm-hmm. uh, saying, we'll be right back. Yeah, I guess I would wonder why would the producer not want to show exactly what they were claiming they were going to show. That's the part of the story that doesn't add up to me. Yeah, I the, the way and I, I said this to you as we were talking about this, the way I would describe that is. It could be that you have a producer who fully expects absolutely nothing to happen. And so he has his, his show completely planned out, timed out, because he's only allotted the two-hour break or whatever it is. He's got to get the commercials in. He's got to be done by 10 o'clock or whenever this thing is, is over. So to have anything unexpected happen would send things into a panic, even if it was a, a, a malfunction. Um, you can see how that would throw things off. But... If it were the seance actually working, he wouldn't be expecting that either. I would imagine this is a person producing the show that doesn't believe in this stuff. He's just trying to make a dime based on... You imagine it or that just makes the fact that they went to commercial make sense? That's one way to make the go cutting to commercial make sense if it was the seance working. Um, I could see that being the scenario where he wasn't expecting anything. He wanted to be out of there at 10 o'clock and now suddenly we're actually getting a ghost here um i don't know what the fuck to do let's cut the commercial so it's i guess with the clip it's a little less creepy i what's interesting to me i guess is imagine so there's very few clips up there and this is what it was like in the 80s if you tape something you have it but otherwise you've just seen it once you know it's just something you saw if that one clip, because you're right, you corrected me on how William Shatner speaks, you corrected me on what we're seeing. If the clip that this guy was talking about was not online, let's say that one clip was not available. This is the special you do remember. It's the special you do enjoy. And now here's an article about the special where someone who worked on it is saying, here's what happened that night off camera. How much more impactful would that story be then? Without the visual evidence, it would it would be hugely impactful, right? Yeah, and I would have been so happy that I had seen it, even though I don't remember that, and I wouldn't be able to to recall that happening. But knowing that I had watched it and this this story is being told about what actually happened, that would have just been like that would have blown me away. And imagine finding that out at a younger, as a younger oh, kid, yeah. a year after you saw it, for a week sure. after you saw it, whatever. Yeah. Because I, that's horrifying. That's, and that is something that is different. I mean, in the eighties and the nineties, I mean, there were a lot of, I mean, this is almost like an urban legend now. This is like a pop culture urban legend about the Houdini special. And there was a fair number of urban legends and pop culture 
urban legends growing up there that as a kid and there's a thing about because I didn't have the internet yet you know I'm ha- I'm glad I do but because I didn't have it as a kid I didn't have YouTube Wikipedia I didn't have ways to research and validate things you could just hear a story or just read a story they get passed around a little bit like a game of telephone but with little research and it could creep you into thinking it's real yeah like there's very little fact checking on the story we just told there's very little on the line in terms of a trail about this it's one guy's story and honestly someone else who worked on the show would have come forward probably by now and said yeah that happened william shatner himself would say yeah that happened right but right. but this story there's there's an element to that tied in with this thing i saw as a child that works like i do have goosebumps right now there is a little bit of a chill to this and and i think there are different ways information gets passed around now. And it's great that it does. And you can look stuff up as a kid in the eighties. And I think maybe why don't we talk about a couple of these things? There were just creepy behind the scenes stories told about things that we knew in real life, movies or, or, or TV shows and weird little things that happened that maybe we could catch a glimpse because they were caught on film or maybe we heard about, so we had this little inner knowledge. There, there was an unease and an eeriness to existence with these stories when there was no way to validate it other than a random person is telling me this is the fact. Like, do you, can you think of any from childhood? Are there things, be, you know, this special, I didn't hear about this till a couple of years ago, but were there things as a kid that you can remember that were kind of like creepy paranormal things tied into, and I know you can because we discussed before the show what they were. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I think one of the um, earliest ones that I remember um, was the the ghost in Three Men and a Baby. Jesus, I'm scared just thinking about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, what's, what's the story with that? What's well, the again, story I think fucking... people hear different stories. I think they're somewhat similar. Um, but the story well, I... Tell the story you heard. The story yeah. I heard um, was that the, the, the building in which they were filming. Um, so Three Men and a Baby, that's uh, Steve Gutenberg, Ted Danson, and Tom Selleck. They're uh, successful, rich bachelors, I guess, who have the first floor or the top penthouse apartment yeah. of this building. And then they inherit a baby somehow. Yes. And, and I had heard that a, a, a boy, 12, I guess, maybe, um, had died in that building and the story i heard was that he either committed suicide and fell off the building or was accidentally fell off the building but i had heard that he he, i had heard suicide he he, he, he fell from the building and his ghostly image is captured in the film as the film pans the floor that they're on and and there's a scene he can be seen um just standing at the window perhaps the window he fell out of or jumped out of and uh, he's there behind a curtain, just it's staring. It's a creepy scene. Oh. It's all in one shot. Oh, it's creepy. You've, you've seen it, right? You've oh, watched yeah, it? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's one of those, it, it was tonight. one of those ones that, like, pre-internet that um, you would go to Blockbuster and, and try and rent it and check it out. Or or if somebody had it, you would you would show the scene or somebody w- would have it and, and pop it in and you would check it out. Yeah, so it's it's a shot. It's Ted Danson is in the scene, and some old lady I don't know who that who the performer is um, is coming over probably the dote over the, the Olivia the baby. Dukakis, I believe. Is it? She's in. Look who's talking. Is that Olivia? I Olivia don't know. Dukakis. Maybe it is. So the camera's moving all at once, and what's weird is I watched it tonight beforehand. So Ted online? Danson and possibly online. Yeah. Uh, uh, I went to the New York apartment and <laughs> stared. Um, I hired uh, my good friend Ned Tanson. <laughs> And Olympus Mons Dukakis. <laughs> no, but they, they're 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 talking, and so the, it's all in one shot. The camera follows them. They're at one part of the apartment. They walk past the window. And you don't see anything when they do, but they walk past the window towards the bed. They pick up the baby. They're doting over the baby. I said doting twice because it's written in my notes. They pick the baby up. They walk back the way they came, and as they walk past the way they came, if you're not looking at them, and if you're looking at the window. Suddenly, when they move back, there's a figure there. There's a very stern looking figure watching them. They don't acknowledge it. They don't see it. It's in the shot. It's right behind the curtain in the window. And it's in the shot for a couple of words. And I think they move out of the range of it. 
And I had seen the movie as a kid. I watched the movie. I liked the movie. I didn't know that, didn't notice it. And then I started hearing people talk about it. You know, I think it was, um, it was after I saw the movie that I heard about it. It was probably on the playground or something. People just started hearing about, hey, do you know there's a ghost mm. in Three Men and a Baby? People were just talking about it. And suddenly I didn't want to watch the movie. Yeah. I didn't want to see the footage. It wasn't until Entertainment Weekly the magazine ran an article about supernatural stuff in movies years later i even saw a screenshot of it but do you remember how did you find out about it ah god i really don't know it's at this point it's just one of those things that uh, that just became general knowledge somehow um was it a movie you had seen do you think by the time you heard about it? i had seen three men and the baby before learning about the the ghost yeah. Um, it was a fun movie. My mom loved it. It's a yeah. cute movie. I like all those actors. Yeah. Sure. Um, and so it probably was the type of thing where it was a schoolyard thing or, or some other friend heard about it and mentioned it. And uh, I can't remember if we watched it or somebody showed it um, or if then I saw it on a on a news, you know, like Entertainment Tonight or something might have shown it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it just sort of became general knowledge. It just And then everybody knew about it, too. If It just would come up now and again. Yeah, and you, like you, you had just said, you'd have to go rent it. You'd yeah. have to go rent it. And when you did, I don't think people necessarily would say when in the movie was. So it was being like a forensic scientist. You're you're constantly yeah. probably looking at the screen. And again, I didn't. I didn't want to see it. And I was that, too scared. That creepy this anticipation that had... of, oh, is it going to come now? Is it now? Yeah. Oh, they're back in the apartment. Is it now? And it changed the feel of this fun movie that was a big hit, directed by Mr. Spock, where they sing good that <laughs> song that Shana Nas sings. It changed it in my mind to this eerie thing that's like, I don't want to watch it. I might see a ghost. And that hung over me for a while. Have you watched it recently? I haven't watched it recently. Um, it's terrifying. Is it? It actually I is. I have seen the debunking of it. Have you seen? Well, yeah. I was I was going to slowly get to that. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Taking away yes. the creep. Well, that's okay. I yes. So b- go ahead. Uh, well, I mean, the, what I've seen to sort of debunk it is um, either earlier in the movie or perhaps it's later in the movie. That same image can be more clearly seen, and it and it's a, a cardboard cutout for some sort of advertisement because I guess one of them is an advertising agent. It's a yeah. It's Ted Danson. Yeah. with a beret. Oh, it, it's and a Ted. Thing- Dancing cutout? It's a Ted Dancing cutout because he's an actor in the movie and it's in their house for some reason. I see. And also, I i mean, what disproved it for me, because I, I remember thinking like, well, that that's just a cover up. Why would he have that? It's not in the movie. Uh, Three Men and a Baby filmed on a set, <laughs> filmed in Hollywood on a right. set that they built of an apartment. So it wasn't <laughs> even in a New York apartment. And that I learned when I learned how movies were made. So no, it's, it's not a ghost, people. And if you look at it now, again, like tonight before we recorded, I went back and I watched it, and it gave me the goose chill, the goose chills. It goosed my well, cause, yeah, whatever. Because here's the thing, and here's here's why these things get us, um, is because we kind of, I think you and I both want them to be real. Mm-hmm. And so when we see them, we see them as a reality. When I'm watching the Houdini clip and the guy keeps looking left, that freaks me out because... He's clearly looking at something that's bothering him or that's surprising him. And I want that to be what he's looking at. I don't want him to be looking at a prop malfunction. I want him to be looking at uh, an impossible plexiglass warping. Well, I- sure. Scary, scary and terrifying things are scary and terrifying if you believe in them. Yeah. <laughs> I And I agree. I also think like something like the three men and a baby ghost thing. It's scary because it was all talk. Because, again, nobody owned the movie. You'd have to rent it. You'd have to go out and find it. So it wasn't like you could type into your web browser, which, again, I'm glad we can do this. But you can't type in, like I did today, three men and a baby ghost and get the photo. And then you can look at the photo. And if you get the photo, it's a creepy photo. If you get a high-definition version of the photo, it's Ted Dance with a beret. Right. Plus, also, you you punch that in and you get the photo. But you also get the articles that that show you why that's not a ghost and and all the other clips that show you why it's not a ghost it's accessible information and again it would make that is how i would look something up if somebody told me a ghost story i would look it up online but there was something back then to this hovering story and i think there's still ways for this to work but with the story that's kind of hovered out there that i was gonna have to do the research work 
to find it. Like I, I shit. Now I have to sit through the movie and keep an eye open. And I'm going to be that anticipation. Yeah. It's like when you know there's a mouse in your house and it's not so much that the mouse bothers you. It's like when that thing moves, I'm going to jump. Yeah. It's that kind of feeling. And, and the fact that you have to do the leg work yourself, I think is what it was. The story is being passed around. So everybody tells it a little differently, but to see this footage, you have to find it. And then you have to, you know, you, you rent the tape, you mark the time code and then you invite your friends over and you'll watch it. And you're like, there's the ghost. There's the ghost. Suddenly you're a researcher. Suddenly you're invested in the story. Suddenly you're part of the urban legend because you're looking looking for it and that made it horrifying because i was bringing it into my house to look at it it kind of reminds me of um one of the um ones that i the urban legends i was thinking of earlier is the whole thing of um playing records backwards yeah and um if our listeners are millennials they know what they are but for people maybe born in 1981 um you know uh, our record was a way of listening to music <laughs> That predated really my interest in music. I didn't have a lot of records. But um, there was a big fear in the 80s that I remember. There was a big Christian movement and, and a lot of outrage to this idea that rock and roll stars are putting backward messages in their records. Subliminal messages in their records. And if you play the record backwards, yep, yep, yep you know, whatever. I can't do the impression. I'm not the guy from uh, from from police uh, academy. But but you know, if you play it backwards, you're going to hear what the musician intended you to hear. Yeah, you're going to hear a secret message, a dark message, a subliminal hidden knowledge message. And that's a creepy idea because you know you can't do it with a cd you can't do it with a cassette but a record is a physical thing and it would be, when everybody had records you know everyone had a record player so you could actively listen to your records backwards and i as a as a young kid i remember just some sunday afternoon just flipping around tv and it might have been pbs it might have been some news program there's just a news segment about that and it was tell, telling various stories of different musicians who, if you play it backwards, you're going to hear certain satanic things. And they mentioned Prince. They mentioned Billy Joel. They mentioned Ozzy Osbourne. Billy Joel. Yeah. God. It was, it was, uh, I can't make an uptown girl joke. I was gonna. <laughs> um, uh, but, but the, the, they mentioned Led Zeppelin. Led Zeppelin was a famous one that I heard that if you play Stairway to Heaven backwards, you're going to hear something. And, by 1991, I had acquired a record player. I didn't have one for a while, but I, I'd gotten one. Um, and then my dad's cousin gave me a box of just old 70s and 80s records. So that was kind of cool. And one of those records was Led Zeppelin IV. Um, and that was the one I remembered from the special. They said, if you play Led Zeppelin IV backwards, you're going to hear a message. It's stirring stairway to heaven. So I had a couple friends over one night. And we were talking about ghosts because that's what we're into. We were talking about the supernatural. And then we were talking about demons. And demons are scarier than ghosts to me. The idea of the devil is scarier yeah, than they're, ghosts they're to me. they're evil. Well, they, yeah, or the bestial, or they have def definite corporal bodies. I don't know what it is, but but we were talking about it. We were talking about records, and I was like, you know what? I have Stairway to Heaven, I said. You know, we're sitting down there on the, the well-lit kitchen table kind of hanging out. I was like, I've got Stairway to Heaven, and I've got a record player. It's up in my room, but I've got those. We, 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 we could play it backwards. So again... It's this kind of thing where we know the story. We know that if you play Stairway Backwards, you're going to hear something evil, something satanic in it. And it's kind of a fun urban legend. But you don't know the sound. It's not like you can just go to YouTube and type in Stairway to Heaven Backwards. Right. You have to actively find it. Yeah. So my friends and I would have to actually... Stairway to Heaven is a pretty long song. It's like a seven or eight minute song. So to the, 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 the play it on the record, you'd have to play it backwards. So we went up to my room where the record player was. We turned the record player on. We put Led Zeppelin uh, 4 in, side 2. And you, know, you have to trace your finger to reverse it. You get, you have to physically move it yourself. Right. And Stairway, you know, starts where it would end and we're playing it backwards. I'm sure we're making jokes about how long it is. We're just kind of doing it. And again, it's just, it's friends hanging out. It's friends who have an interest in the paranormal who want to talk about the paranormal, finding kind of a safe way to play around a little bit with the paranormal. Because stuff backwards does sound kind of creepy. And we're doing it, and we're, we're moving it backwards, and we're kind of joking and talking. And, and in the middle of one of us talking, we all stop. <sighs> we all stop speaking because the voice on the record that I've been playing backwards that has been nonsense, that has just been the sound of just what it sounds like, you know, gibberish when you reverse, very clearly... And in a voice that totally interrupted us and cut us down because it was so succinct, we heard 
My Sweet Satan, oh, as we're spinning the record backwards. Did you know I've never heard it? Oh, like really? I've there's never a, even heard a, a sample of it. There, If you look it up on YouTube, there's a lot. I yeah. listened to it tonight, and there's a lot that's said. But that, again, because we were doing the work of looking for it, we didn't know where it was going to be. And it was physically happening there. It wasn't just a video. It wasn't a transcription. It wasn't a special. It's creepy. You made it happen. We made it happen. Yeah. We summoned it. And it was in my room. <laughs> and I let the record go, so it started playing again. Because it, it just creeped me out enough. Because, it one, it was unexpected when it happened. And, two, yeah, we did it. And, again, it's it, Led Zeppelin says it's not what's intended. It can very well just be what things are backwards. Right. Um, you know, but the fact that it happened right there, that, and because it's one of the stories that was told, you always hear about backwards masking, backwards masking. Now we're part of that story because we did it. And there's that lingering thought of, well, what did we do? What does it mean? Blah, blah, blah. But it's more just eerie because we had to do the work. Are there any, are there other ones? Like, do, do, is, are there things from childhood that kind of creeped you out maybe a little bit? Um, I didn't. The, the other one that, that always creeped me out, um, I didn't quite hear about until college. And I'm not sure if it was a thing before then or, or not. Um, but it was I was always creeped out by the Wizard of Oz story, uh, which is how in one of the scenes in the forest as they're walking on the Yellow Brick Road, near the end of one of the songs, it's a wide shot. And in the background, you can see a person... Uh, apparently take their own life uh, by uh, hanging um, in, in on the set of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, some say it's a munchkin, one of the actors that played a munchkin. Um, one of us said that earlier uh, before the show started. Uh, yes. Um, but um, I had heard about that for a while uh, before I ever got around to, to watching it. And for me, the way that that happened was... I was watching The Wizard of Oz. Um, must have been on TV one time, and I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll sit and watch The Wizard of Oz. I like The Wizard of Oz. And as I'm watching it, and it gets to a part in the forest, I remember that there's this story that you can see someone hang themselves. And, and so I do the sort of thing that you do, where you sort of lean forward in your seat um, to just sort of watch it. And so I start watching the background instead of the thing. And just as I remembered, and just as I started watching the background, whoosh, there it is. There's this shadowy figure in the background that just drops down from, from somewhere. And you can see this body hanging from a line, uh, swaying back and forth for a moment before it cuts to the next scene or fades out or whatever it does. And like this is a movie you've watched multiple times, hundreds of times. And now I'm in college. At the, I would have to say I'm in college when I finally. And then the fact that I was watching, I'd been watching it because it happens maybe 25 minutes in, um, and I've been sitting there watching it that whole time. And only in that moment did I remember, and only in the moment that I did did I remember that that's a thing. Did I actually see it happen? And it just it freaked me out. So part of it is, yeah, it's out of the blue it happened. Yeah. Part of it is that you see it. And then, it, again, it's this thing from childhood. It's the Wizard of fucking Oz. Right. It's this light, breezy musical of fun songs. And here, caught on tape, is is someone taking their life. Did you rewind it when you saw it? Or was I was, it watch, I was probably TV? watching it on television, so I didn't have that capability at that time. Could you stay with it, or did it take you out of the movie? Um, I probably, I probably stopped watching the movie. Yeah, like I, I, it was no longer about enjoying the memory and 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 nostalgia of the Wizard of Oz. It was now about I think I just saw somebody hang himself. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move on now. Creepy. I mean, have you gone back to the movie since? Have you watched it again? I have. Since then? I've watched it again, and I see that scene, um, and I'm no longer thrown by it because having now seen it repeatedly i don't believe that that's what that is and i i believe that you know um there's articles and and things that that prove that it's not that um, um it's a bird is what i've heard it's yeah a it's a, it's a some sort of you know live creature that's that's on the set and there's others that you can see that kind of prove that but it's so weird that it became this thing. Obviously, it's a trick of light. Somebody's eyes played on it. But someone just talking about it 
that effect of just the telephone effect is like, that's what, you know, it gets to you. It's like someone died. And so that, cause do you think you would have noticed that otherwise? I would it have stuck out the strange, cause it's a strange movement. It's a strange. Yeah. Motion. I mean, I don't know that I would have, but eventually maybe you would notice it. You watch the movie enough times you start, your eyes start to wander, I guess. And I can see how you see that the first person to notice that, um, uh, might make up this story or might say, hey, does that look like somebody hanging themselves? And then that just sort of, you know, slowly spreads word of mouth. Oh, God, this, there, there's a guy that, there's a person hanging themselves on, in The Wizard of Oz. And As an adult, that's probably better to see than as a kid. When you inject this darker angle, yeah, that's creepy. That's eerie. And, and you find it on your own and you have to wonder, is this real? Do other people see it? I mean, the story, and this is a story I read more recently, but one of my favorite kind of dark pop culture conspiracies, because it is so unnerving, um, is about the video game Polybius. Do you know the story of Polybius? No. Am I pronouncing you, it right? You posted about this earlier today, yeah. and it sparked my interest. I didn't have a chance to look it up, so now I'm excited to learn about what this is. So, um, 1980s arcades were pretty big, were huge actually. Video games, the whole video game cabinet, as they're called, or calculate, you know, council where you go, you drop your quarter and you play video game. That was a big part of the 80s. That's a big, I didn't even go to arcades that much, but when I think about 80s, that's one of those things I, I think about. You know, there's Pac Man, there's Dig Dug, there's Galaga, whatever. Um, Polybius was one of these arcade game cabinets. Um, it was a game that people that some people remember existing it wasn't one that was found everywhere it wasn't this game that you know like donkey kong shows up and everybody's waiting in line to play donkey kong um or you know there's an ad in a comic book for pitfall and everybody wants to play pitfall whatever polybius was an arcade game that um almost like it was kind of was circulated for maybe testing in just a few markets in uh portland oregon for just a few months in 1981 it was just this very straightforward, all black game cabinet with the word Polybius written on the top. It was the, you know, the computer screen that you play. And there's maybe four or five arcades that had it all in Portland, Oregon. And, um, you know, people always love a new game. Crystal Castle showed up, people get in line for that. Burger Time showed up, people get in line for that. And the Polybius, this particular game, Polybius, was apparently um, a very addictive game. Like people saw it, so it wasn't at other arcades, it was just at these couple, they would get in line, they would play it for hours, and it was kind of like a mixture of light patterns and and, and sort of strange gameplay that, that people just stuck with it, you know, and, and it, it like crack. <laughs> you know, people played it like it was fucking crack cocaine. They were obsessed with it. Uh, but the obsession wasn't just playing the game. Slowly, they would be suffering from from headaches, you know, or as they're playing, they would get nauseous. Or when they finally stepped away from the screen, they, they, they would get these these hallucinations. And and I get that. You stare at a screen long enough, you got these shapes going. You, know, yeah. you, can, you can get a little nauseous. But it's this idea that it, it, it was striking people down like a disease. You know, kids in these particular neighborhoods... You know, now as adults, remember seeing the game in a couple, you know, one or two arc arcades that, you know, they would go to these arcades and they, they, they would see the game councils. But, you know, a lot of them wouldn't play it. And those who did seemed to be struggling. They'd stumble. They'd pass out. They they did have these horrifying nightmares. They'd have these. They, they wouldn't be able to sleep. It was just it, it was like getting into people's skulls at the same time. People who were who were playing the game or in these arcades would would see quite often that the, this particular game cabinet, Polybius, would be visited by uh, military types. You know, people dressed in black, the men in black, who would come into the machine, push everyone away, and I don't know, not drain quarters from it, but would sort of data mine some sort of information from the cabinet before leaving. More stories began to abound that you know players of this game were suffering night. Terrors that they, uh, some of them were even going missing. <laughs> um, and, and for just a couple of weeks, Portland became this hotbed of terror. You know, people were reeling from the effects of this, like, I don't know, demon machine in the arcade. It was getting into people's heads. People's friends were, were suddenly gone, strange men in black coming in. And then all of a sudden, one day, the machines vanished. 
they were no longer in the arcade. The simple black cabinet with the word Polybius was gone. You know, and some people claim it was a military raid. Some people say they saw a flatbed truck driving ominously through the town very early in the day, pulling up and just loading up each each machine. <laughs> and, and the game just vanished. It never hit the national circuit. It never got to an arcade in Connecticut or wherever, you know, you lived in Oneida. It just it never got out there. It never got any marketing. It's not like you can find an old comic book with a Polybius ad in it. It's not like people saw, you know, a a TV ad for it. It it pretty much faded from the local Portland consciousness um, until the start, actually the 21st century, around 2000, when um, a single screen grab of the the title screen uh, showed up in someone's online article. Just a screen that told you you're watching... You know, it says Polybius with a press start and then the name of the company that produced it. it just showed up in an article asking if people remembered this game. And since then, huh. in the 20 years since this article was published, people have come forward with, um, with vague memories of the game, you know. Uh, not a whole lot of who have played it, mostly having watched it, but... But there's some people have come forward and, it, you know, the, maybe not anything concrete like how the gameplay works. No one seems to be able to tell how the game works. Right. They have just flashes, you know, here and there about about the screen and things like that. But people, more and more people started remembering, yeah, Polybius, I know that name. Or, yeah, it was, it was weird. It kind of showed up in this arcade and then it was gone. And about two years ago, a seven-part podcast called the Polybius Conspiracy uh, showed up in my news feed. Showed up in anybody's news feed, but showed up in mine. All right. Um, in a detail... Just yours. Just mine. And it detailed a horrible history of a couple individuals who were involved with this story. Um, horrific tales of being kidnapped, of being drugged. These were the game players. These are the game players. Kids. They would have been kids at the time. They were threatened because of their involvement with the game some awoke in these strange underground bunkers that they had their you know that they escaped from had you not heard of it before you don't know the game i had not heard of it i do not know the game that was not uh anything that that ever ever stood out for me yeah i'll link the podcast in the show notes the fascinating it's disturbing it's a disturbing show to listen to but it's worth listening do you do you have any um in the back of your mind do you have any thought that that this could be just sort of like a Blair Witch sort of thing, where that's what a lot of people where it was say. just I mean, created for the entertainment of that podcast or for the entertainment of well, something it was created else. before the podcast. The podcast does feed off of this existing story, yeah. And I think the podcast pokes a lot of holes in it by the time you get to the end of it, not to ruin the show. I'm going to link in the show notes, sure. but no, I think it could very well have been something that was created when on someone's blog. You know, I think if you do the research, I forget where, but the first mention of it was in someone's blog. Yeah. So it's kind of like it's maybe the last remnant of this kind of, it's right on the cusp, you know? Right, right. Because we can put anything out there now. We can type up our stories and now there exactly. is a log of it. I yeah. mean, the way I found out about the story for, for Search for Houdini is because one person wrote a blog about an unnamed <laughs> possible technician. Right. Who maybe saw the table curl up. Right. And anybody that, that saw the clip and knows that they cut to commercial could have made that completely up. You know? But also anyone who saw that clip and remembers it when they read that blog, if they don't have the clip, if they don't have the special on tape, if they've only seen it that one time and it stuck with them for whatever for example, for you, for the reason it stuck with you, you were fascinated by it. Yeah. The moment you read this story that's gonna that could very well influence your memory of it yeah because suddenly it's like oh right i do remember that i mean i did it i did it when i was explaining a scene that doesn't exist of shatner breaking for commercial right as you pointed out that's actually a very well delineated he's poorly reading the teleprompter break for commercial it's 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 not as panicked as as we wanted it to be based on the the whole concept of what we think might have happened uh yeah we make it we make it that way because, like I was saying before, it's like we want it to be real. We want the fun story. Yeah, we want and, the and fun I, story. I, we want the paranormal. I think you and I both enjoy the scare and the potential and the possibility. And so, yeah, we want that. I don't know what the point of 
wanting to believe these stories is? Or is it just wanting to tell them? Like, it it was fun to relate the Polybius story to you. I, I was... Uh... I was uh, on the edge of my seat listening to you retell that. That was uh, terrifying, and in and, and yeah, that's. But do you buy it? Do you think it happened? Um, I think it could have happened. Um, that's a different answer, though. I don't. Any of these could have happened. I don't think I buy that it was a conspiracy and a and a. a a military experiment. It may have been a shitty game that gave people headaches. <laughs> you know, that they decided, nope, we're going to get sued. Let's get rid of this thing. So what's the point of the story existing then? Why tell a story of a game that doesn't exist? We read fiction. We know how fiction works. Why present it as a real thing? I, I think because there are people, there are people that like, that like there to be a scare and that want people to think there's still a possibility that such things are possible and, and that exist. I don't know if you remember this, but I uh, did something uh, four years ago, maybe five years ago. Um, uh, when we moved into to where we live now, we have a, a, a garage. And the man that uh, lived here before, I'm told, was a bit of a handyman. And he built the cabinets uh, in the garage. And I hadn't noticed this for the first year and a half that we'd been there. But there was one cabinet that had hinges on it but it was screwed shut and it was also painted black like the and it was the only one the 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 panel that was screwed shut was painted black none of the other panels were were screwed shut there were other cabinets that i could open but for whatever reason this one that had hinges on it it was screwed shut now this was just soon after facebook live became a thing (laughs) so i was like holy shit i'm gonna open this and I, Facebook, you know, I went onto Facebook and I said, hey, in about a half an hour, I'm going to go live and I'm going to open up this sh- sealed shut hinged door. And just the idea of doing that, I, I probably in the back of my mind, probably in the front of my mind, knew that this, there's nothing in here. And if it's anything, it's just old crap from this guy. Um, but in the back of my mind, I was like, this is some creepy shit. Let's make it creepier by sharing it, you know, like like getting people to watch. And I think, you know, a handful of people did. Uh, and- but imagine telling that. So telling that like you're telling is scary. Yeah, that's great. There's anticipation. You can picture it. The Facebook live feed. Was that tense? Was that scary? I, I made it so, <laughs> you know, I I tried. I was like, look, we're going to do this, guys. And I like. I, I went through it just like I was fucking Geraldo Rivera. I first showed, you know, the wide shot of the whole cabinet mechanism. I opened and closed doors that did work. And then I went close up on the hinges. And I was like, why on earth are hinges on this sealed panel? There's no need for it. And then I knocked on the wood and it's clearly hollow. This this panel, and then I focused on the on the screws i did the whole thing i did all the filler i would have reenacted the, the making of the cabinets if i had had time um and then i got my screwdriver out and i unscrewed it slowly one at a time took it out i i unscrewed them all before i even attempted to open it and then i opened it and it was just an empty cabinet absolutely <laughs> nothing in it but then i hypothesized or maybe somebody commented i'm not sure um that I just unleashed Satan, who had been trapped in there. You know, just the spirit. My sweet Satan, to quote yeah. Stairway to Heaven backwards. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's like people like to be scared. People like to have this unknown thing occur that maybe it's real, maybe it's not real. Like, I don't know. There's something about the possibility because mm-hmm. I like the scare. I like telling the ghost story. I like, I like adding reality to those stories uh you know i like props and sound effects and and anything else i could think of to to freak them out a little so these stories don't have to be real to be enjoyed no in fact you probably think they're not real for the most part huh well they might be though the ones we've Hmm. talked about are not (laughs) but there i'm sure there are others out there um, in pop like culture, like the pop rocks, I didn't bring up. Yeah, the pop like rocks, like Mikey and the but, pop but rocks. That's, that's also not real, and we know that's not real. 
But there, I'd like to know the ones that are out there that might be real. I'm sure there's others that we haven't thought of or didn't mention. Um, and I think that would be a, a nice thing to hear from our audience about, Tim. Oh, like if they're possessed or if they have an implant <laughs> or if they were abducted because of their high score on Qbert. I showed you my implant scar, right? On my, I think you may have shown me a scar. On my palm. <laughs> yeah. But listeners, if you uh, if you want to implant this show <laughs> into your uh, podcast player, uh, you can. Is that was that we covered what we need to cover? Right, we're good. Yes, I thought I was making that segue quite clear. I think you did, so maybe <laughs> okay. I'll cut some of this out. Uh, you can you can uh, you can subscribe to the show. That's what you can do. You can, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, on Radio Public, on a bunch of other um, apps. Go to uh, go to twenty popcast dot com. That's the the show's main website. Uh, there you always find the most recent uh, episode streaming, as well as links to all of our past episodes. You can listen to those as well. Uh, you can also again subscribe to us. You can follow us on Twitter at 20 Popcast uh, Instagram that's the same address uh, I would ask if you're a fan of the show where we've got some big things coming up I think we've got some plans for some changes and some new ideas and stuff coming up in the coming months so so please check out the website please head down there it's going to be more information every week um, that we can kind of stay on top of it um, and that would be great for us because we're looking to keep you as a listener boy that's weird Bob um, sure. Yeah, I'll agree with you, Tim. That was weird. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't know where I, I, I took a deeper breath than I meant to. And that's what came out. <laughs> uh, but no, I uh, I'll reiterate that I really do want to hear from other people about any pop culture urban legends they know of, but also any any just personal urban legends that that happened to them or that um, they know of in their small town. Because um, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that that all sorts of ghost stories people like to tell. Um, so I'd love to hear that. Um, Tim, you gave all the show information. I'll give my personal information. If you want to reach out on Twitter at RH Canning, you can find me there. Um, so, so reach out, let us know. And uh, yeah, I always know we've reached the end, Tim, when you ask some sort of deep philosophical question that I just cannot answer. And you, you mean prior to this? Yeah, prior or the to question this. where that's, I said that's, prior that's to That's how this. I knew we were ready for the segue out. Oh, okay. Yeah, wrapping it up, people. That's how we wrap it up. We take the thesis that we should open the show with, and we <laughs> say it at the end. So next week, expect our introductions to be one of the first things you hear. But the reason that we're talking about that particular episode of Mr. Belvedere, wait till the end. That's when that will come out. That works, right? It does. Well, uh, happy Halloween, everyone, if this seemed like that. Did this seem like a Halloween episode? No. It did huh. towards the end towards the end yeah but houdini not really halloween-esque no. william shatner all about being halloween-esque because he got his face skin to make a mask for a movie with that same title and it all comes full circle <laughs> <laughs>